we're going to pick up the theme. Uh, every Sunday night uh, since I started this sort of summer series in the Psalms, and, and uh, every, every week has been joy. It's sort of been this theme, and we're going we're gonna to stay there tonight. I just believe wholeheartedly, and you guys have heard me say it many times, I just believe Christians ought to live with joy. I just don't think we ought to go around with gloom and doom. I just don't have everything. <laughs> I just don't think we ought to be gloom and doom type of, type of people. We have victory uh, over sin, death. I mean, look, God, we're overcomers. And so I believe we ought to live uh, with joy. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 32 uh, this evening. I'll ask you in just a moment to stand as we honor the reading of God's inspired, infallible uh, inerrant word. Uh, but, but if I had to title this message, I didn't. I just said Psalms 32 was, was just what I was going to. But I was thinking about it. And, and here's the thing. Sin doesn't have to win. That's really what, what this is. Sin doesn't have to win. Uh, Psalm 32 in your Bible, it may say uh, at the top of it, it may say uh, a, a Psalm of David. Uh, it may say a mescal, uh, the term perhaps denoting a Psalms written to make a person wise or prudent to increase a person's success or skill. So sin, this whole thing will be uh, concerning sin and, and some of the things we can learn from, from David, I believe, in this Psalm, but sin, a very real thing. Uh, we, uh, uh, sin is a very real thing no matter what the world wants us to think about sin or wrongdoing. It's, it's a very up close and tangible thing in our modern culture. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to look at other people, by the way, to see sin. Just look in the mirror. Y'all all right? Just look in the mirror. Something, right? We all have sinned. Come, come short of what God desires us to be sometimes. And so the Bible speaks of sin repeatedly. Uh, some form of, of, of the, the noun sin or the word sin, uh, interesting enough, it, it occurs over 470 times in the Bible. Sin, the word. Uh, and so uh, I just have to ask the question, though, if sin's mentioned with such frequency and number, how is it that we have many preachers and pastors today who never preach about it? For never preach on it, but do a great job preaching around it. And so the simple takeaway, though, is God's forgiveness gives believers the ultimate reason to rejoice. Because we're sinners, saved by grace, we ought to be rejoicing in the matter. And so if you're physically able, I'd ask you to stand as we read Psalm 32. And then we're going to look here what we can learn from David here. Uh, it says, Blessed is, is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in his whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my, bron my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity. I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Uh, for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. In a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near me. Not, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle. Either else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. That's a troubling and a burdening verse for me. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord. Here it is. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray tonight you'd encourage hearts tonight, Lord, with your word. As we can see a few lessons that we can learn from David here in your word, Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Here's some lessons I want to speak to you tonight that we can learn from this uh, word here uh, in Psalm 32. And the first thing is restoration from sin is a blessing. Restoration from sin is a blessing. He says, blessed is he's, he's whose trust, transgressions is forgiven. Now, how is it that David speaks here being joyful? Blessed when he has made some tragic 
and devastating mistakes. Uh, let's look at these words here before we look at how blessed we are because we're, we're, we're forgiven. Transgressions, that speaks of rebellion. It speaks of disloyalty, not just simply a mistake. Did y'all know sometimes we make mistakes and we don't really understand we're making mistakes? But then there's other times where we willfully know that before we even do it, it's wrong and we do it anyway. And so that's what a transgression is. It's a willful defiance and disobedience to the word of God and the standard of the Lord. And then you look at sin, right? Uh, to, that's just to miss the mark. It's an archery term. Uh, again, a willful departure to missing the clear and express will of God. And then we look at forgiven. Now, this is, this is why, it's, why, why it's important to understand the blessing of being forgiven. It's the taking the sin away. It's carrying it away. Uh, it's, it's rem y'all remember the scapegoat? It'd be led all the way out of the camp so it couldn't find its way back in. That's, that's how, that's how great being forgiven is. And we, the Bible talks about that, that the, the sins got to, they'll be as far from the east from the west from his mind. And so we are forgiven. And when we are forgiven, that brings a blessing that we ought to be thankful for. We ought to be thankful for it. it talks about covered. That speaks of atonement. Not only are our sins carried away, but there's also mercy. And these sins, they're not only removed, he covers them. Takes us back. You ought to just look at it. I, we're not going to read all the way through it, uh, but I want you to write it down and you read through it. So you'll understand the blessing of your sins being covered. Just look back at Leviticus 16. And you'll see. Speaks of the gracious forgiveness and reconciliation. So where there's mercy... In confession and trust, God covers and restores. That ought to encourage you tonight. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, iniquity just means crooked, doing something corrupt. So God will not impute that. And impute just means he won't charge you. It's a charge against an account. It's a banking term. God wipes off our sin off the ledger. And we got any CPAs in here? I know we got at least two of them. Uh, we got three of them. That's right. Ryan, you here. That makes three. All right. We got three CPAs. I remember in my, my class when I was over uh, at A&T at uh, studying business, uh, managerial accounting, I had a uh, Dr. Angel. And I, I, was, I, was, I did pretty good in school after I figured out what I needed to be there for, right, which I was a grown man when, 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 I needed, when I knew that. When I was young, I just didn't feel it. I wouldn't feel in school at all. Uh, I just wanted to play ball, and uh, that was about it. But, uh, but I remember that class. In managerial accounting, and he, he'd show you, you know, when you're doing business and you have a ledger, uh, you've got liabilities or, 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 or things that cost, and then you got, got, got the, the positive, right? And so this is something to where if you've got liabilities, something that there's a debt there, and Christ just wipes it off the pages like it ain't even there, that's forgiveness. That is what he does to our sin, and that, that, that should make you happy tonight. That ought to make you rejoice. Uh, this is a verb yes, there is used of God's dealing uh, with Abraham. It says, then he believed in the Lord and God reckoned, he credited it to him as righteousness. We see that in Genesis chapter 15. Martin Luther says it this way, sin has but two places where it might be or it may be. Either it may be with you so that it lies upon your neck or upon Christ, the Lamb of God. If now it lies upon your neck, you are lost. If, however, it lies upon Christ, you are free and will be saved. And so we should. God, listen, God's cleansing of sin and restoration uh, of our relationship with him. Restoration from sin is such a blessing from the Lord. That's something we can learn from David is that re restoration is a blessing uh, when we uh, are re re forgiven for our sin. The second thing we can learn is refusing to admit sin will bring discipline. When we refuse to admit sin, it'll bring. He said, "When I kept silent, my bones grew old. The, through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me." Now the psalmist here experienced divine chastening. Jay was talking about his daddy uh, being, be, you know, disciplining him. Uh, but here we see uh, that David is saying, "The Lord's hand is heavy upon me." There's a divine chastening uh, because he failed to admit. His sin. And he said, the longer that I failed to admit it, the longer I suffered. When he was silent, did not confess, he was weakened physically, it talks about. On bones uh, there and grieved inwardly. 
Psalm 6, uh, 1 through 2 says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. See, silence, this silence, uh, there's another word for it that starts with this, stubborn. How many of us are stubborn with our sin? A stubborn resistance to just admit uh, where we are. A hope that in time the sin and the penalty will go away. Any of y'all ever, ever done something that you knew was against God's will and, and you could feel the heavy hand of God? And you could just sort of feel the discipline, but you just said, hey, if I just wait here long enough and just, just hold out, the sin, the, it'll all go away. Can I tell you, it ain't going away. You'll just grow more weary and more weary. The more David delayed his confession, the more he suffered. And so refusing to admit uh, sin, it, it, it's, it's tough. It brings discipline. Confession, though, releases. The concealing of sin restrains. David realized it was not just his conscience or his feelings that were assaulting him, but the heavy hand of God. So no matter who else is hurt, the principal offense of any sin is always against the Lord. So you may be saying, well, you know what? It's not, not against the Lord. I mean, I'm just going to, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just do something against somebody uh, and it'll just be against them. No, when you do something outside of God's will, I don't care if it's toward somebody or not. It's, it's toward God first. And so you just need to remember that. Now, this hand or power of the Lord is heavy on him. That is, God was dealing severely with him. Now, this result here talks about his, his, his vitality. His strength was sapped talks about it's dried up as in the summer heat. And, and now, we've had some rain here lately. But how many of us remember about six weeks we went and what no rain? I'll tell you what I see every day when I look out my back door. Grass that didn't see no rain in about six weeks. It don't matter how much it's rained the last six days. For six weeks, and my grass was burnt slap up because there was no rain. Can I tell you, that's a great example. That when, you don't, when you're stubborn in your sin... Uh, and there's no forgiveness that's coming, you'll be dried up like my grass in the backyard until rain comes, until forgiveness comes. This expression may refer to a physical illness with burning fever, or it may just describe in poetic language his remorse of his conscience of doing wrong. Sin will do a number on you. How many of us in here know sin will do a number on you? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I've seen people uh, in my lifetime, and I'm a young guy, but I've seen people uh, in my lifetime that have lived in sin, uh, and, 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 and I can see the consequences in their body and on their face. Uh, they, they might be 40, but they look 80 because of what sin has done to them physically. And so sin will do a number on you. I'm telling you, it's like a cancer in your body. It'll cause you to be physically sick many times. And so it also caused you to be spiritually sick. Uh, David's pain and discipline was due to the heavy hand of God. Refusing to admit our sin will bring God's discipline. There's something else that David shows us here. Real acknowledgement sin brings forgiveness. When we'll just acknowledge it, uh, then we'll be forgiven. David acknowledges it, and he says, no longer am I going to cover my I'm going to confess. Now, here David uses this, the same terms that we see in verses 1 and 2. He sees his own sin the way God sees it. Now, that right there is important. Let's just stop right there. Can I tell you, when you look at what you've done wrong, just look at it and, and, and just go ahead and make the, the determination. I'm going to look at my sin the way God looks at my sin. Just go ahead and make the determination. The moment you begin to justify it, that is not looking at your sin like God looks at it. And so you need to know that. Uh, and so if you walk around with, with, with unrighteous anger and you just say, well, I'm justifiable in that because uh, I just I, I think I need to be angry about that. Uh, if it's outside of God's will, it, it doesn't matter how you feel. Remember this morning, truth doesn't take feelings into consideration. And so we need to just admit and about our sin and just look at it the way God looks at it. And just say, I'm going to acknowledge and look at it the way God looks at it. So to admit and confess is to agree with God about our sin. Now, this he, the Hebrew word and the Greek word used here to tran that's translated uh, in the Septuagint both have the idea of telling forth or acknowledging openly one's sin. So if we uncover our sin before God, he covers them up. From his judgment. So the New Testament word used in 1 John 1 9 has the nuance of agreeing together with God. And so you're in agreement with God about where you are in your life and the sin that may be in your life. That's why I honestly believe uh, when I think about a, a particular sin, 
one that really is a hard one for people to get out of. Somewhat, some people say harder than to get off of drugs or alcohol is pornography. And, and, and it's because when I think about this whole thing about, about not agreeing with the Lord, I say, well, it's just a little look. It's just a, I know I'm not hurting anybody. Can I tell you, you're hurting yourself. If you're married, you're hurting your spouse. If you're not married, you're going to hurt your future spouse because now you've got in your mind some tainted version of what God meant when he put intimacy between man and woman and husband and wife in the confines of marriage. So you don't even realize what you're doing. That's why it breaks my heart when I hear, did y'all, did y'all know that pornography is rampant all the way down to like fourth and fifth grade? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've told y'all this before. In the fourth grade, I didn't even want a girlfriend. I didn't want nothing to do with girls. All my buddies, I remember, they said, oh, you'll grow out of it. I'm glad I grew out of it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm glad I grew out of it. They said, oh, you'll grow out of it. I said, look, I, I got too much ball to play. I ain't got time to be worried about broads. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that one sin, the damage it can do, and people justify it. Well, I'm just not hurting anybody. It's just me. Now you're hurting everything about the future of your life when it comes to your marriage, your spouse, even your kids. And so it's, it's a lie. And so we need to agree with the Lord on this. Acknowledge and agree together. It means affirming our attention of abandoning that sin in order to follow God more faithfully. And so he called his relationship there uh, with Bathsheba. He said, hey, it's not a fair, it's adultery. He, he said, hey, what I did to Uriah, it's not misfortune, it's murder. It's what we have to do in order to be able to, to be forgiven. Now, repentance. Let's talk about repentance. Repentance leads to forgiveness. Now, God gives, uh, forgives us. He forgives us from our sin. Can I tell you, it's God's desire to forgive you. Did you know that? It is his desire to forgive you. He's already shown us just how much he desires uh, to forgive us by the shed blood of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. So God wants to forgive sinners. Forgiveness has always been a part of his loving nature. The discipline of God is always to bring us to forgiveness and restoration. I love Jay's example. Uh, after he got a spanking, uh, his daddy would grab him and hold him and hug him and say, I love you. Now, my daddy didn't do that, to be honest. My daddy wasn't, wasn't like that. He wasn't, a, he wasn't just that, that lovey-dovey type of guy. He was a hard man. But I knew he loved me. But, man, when, he, when I got it, I got it. I deserved 99.9% of them. I can't remember maybe one time of the... I don't even know how many spankings I got. But anyway, I only remember maybe one that I was like, I don't know if that was justifiable or not. But, you know, uh, but then again, probably most of them were, were justifiable because most of the time we all got it. If one got it, all three of us got it, even if we wasn't in there. But, but see, that took, that took the case, right? That took the case of the times he didn't find out, and I should have got one. So I, I, I deserved all of them, okay? But the discipline of God's always to bring us to forgiveness, and restoration. Some people I've heard say over the years, well, I know God's forgiven me, but I just can't forgive myself. Well, theologically, you can't forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. Only God can truly forgive and redeem sin. What you need to do is ask for forgiveness and receive it. That's what you need to do. That's the enemy talking to you. Well, God's forgiven you, but you know what? You really need to keep this in your back of your mind because you're bad. No, you just tell the devil, like I always say. Just tell him where he's headed. Uh, maybe there's somebody here tonight who needs to receive God's forgiveness. You've been a prisoner of your own sin for a long time. Your guilt, your shame. I want you to listen to me tonight. It's like being in a prison cell. And King Jesus has the key to let you out. And when you get out, you don't need to bring the ball and chain with you. You can be free. You can be free. There's many believers, I believe, wholeheartedly that walk around with guilt in their life. And shame. Can I tell you, guilt does not come from the Lord. Conviction comes from the Lord. Guilt comes from the devil when you're saved. Conviction, absolutely. God will convict us of our sins. And we'll feel conviction. But guilt comes from the devil. It does. There's a guilty, I'll call it a guilty because I don't know another word for it, but a conviction is something that God, that the Holy Spirit, 
when you're a believer, when you do something outside of the will of God, the Holy Spirit will say, hey, that's against God. And then you know that that's against God. And there's a conviction. There's a sorrow. There's an understanding. I'm doing wrong here. But when you begin to feel shame as a believer after, after, you've, after you've repented, that ain't from God. It's not. Shame's from the devil. So just remember that. Keep the two in the right place. Conviction is from God. You ought to feel sorrow for sin. You ought to feel bad when you go against God. You ought to feel some remorse and not really good about yourself when you go against God's word and you sin. But after you've repented and it keeps coming back up in your mind, that ain't from the Lord. You've already been forgiven. It's shame, guilt comes from the devil. Just remember that. So uh, repentance brings forgiveness. Uh, there's something else here in the text. Resolve for sins found. Now, for this cause, everyone who is godly found in prayer shall pray to him. Now, David encouraged others to seek the Lord because he deals graciously with sinners. How many of us just need sometimes to get along with God and to pray? Every hand ought to be up and you ought to do it every day. Minimal, once a day. I recommend it in the mornings, by the way, uh, because if you get your day going and you get outside of it and you say, oh, man, I haven't done it yet. I'll do it tonight. Most of the time, I'm just telling you from personal experience, maybe it's your experience too. Most of the time, the day will get gone. You'll get that night at bed. Say, oh, man, I, I didn't have time. I'll catch it tomorrow morning. And then if you don't do it tomorrow morning, the day will slip away again. And all of a sudden, you'll be gone like I do with exercise. I do really good about two weeks. About six months later, I go, man, I ain't picked up nothing in six months. Got to get right, Griff. I got to get right. Anyway. The time to pray is when the Lord may be found. David turned to praise from prayer as God being his hiding place, shelter, refuge. God protects from trouble those who trust him. He protects those who trust him. He gives them uh, a reason to praise him. Prayer is the way to the Lord. It's the way to him. We need to pray to the Lord. It's a conversation we ought to have with God. And by the way, most of the time when we go to the Lord, there's so many requests. And he's not Santa Claus. He's not. I like to go to him sometimes. And look, I'm guilty as, as anybody else sometimes about requesting things and just praying. But I like to try to start as best I can. I like to just start by praising him. Just praising God. Whether he shows up, does anything about the situation or not, he's worthy to be praised where he doesn't do anything else again. I've said it many times. Y'all hear me say it many more times if you're here long enough. It doesn't matter if he don't do one more thing for us. He's already done more than we deserve. But I like to praise him. Then I like to thank him. I try not to let the, the requests be known right up front. Uh, but sometimes I'm, I'm guilty of that. Why does David say while he can be found? Especially for those unbelievers. Well, because there's going to come a day when he's no longer able to be found. So when we pray, it brings us security. How many of us, when we get along with the Lord, true to get along with the Lord, spend a little bit of time with him, do y'all feel better or worse when you cut out of prayer time? Better. better. I'll tell you why. Because we feel a sense of protection. We feel a sense of preservation that he's with us. Jay said earlier, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And there's a reason to praise him because we have assurance of the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what's going on in this world. Our life is a vapor. Any of y'all getting ready for winter? Are y'all anybody in here ready for winter? <laughs> Not quite yet, but I am ready to get. I got, one more, I got a couple more beach trips and then I'm ready for fall. I like fall and winter. Fall is my favorite season. Anyway, I'd encourage you to pray. Pray often. It'll do your heart wonders. It will. It'll lead to a healthier and holier walk too, by the way, when you spend some time in prayer. So that's the, that's the fourth point. The fifth point, man, we're just, I'm just walking through the text tonight. Uh, more of a teaching than, I guess, a preaching. This morning was absolute preaching. <laughs> Whew, I'm still, I just, I'm burdened about that. But anyway, right teaching will help keep you from sin. This is important. Sort of goes on with this morning. You start listening to the wrong people, you'll find yourself out there in no man's land. 
If you listen to the Lord, listen to the right teachers, they'll instruct you because it'll all be from God's word. Right teaching will keep you from sin. It says, I'll instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Now, if forgiveness is good, then fellowship's better. If we have experienced God's heavy hand, and I have many times in my life, I can tell you I appreciate and seek the gentler touch of the Lord over the heavy hand of the Lord. I do. I've been on the wrong side of a heavy hand, and it's heavy. God longs to guide us with love and wisdom and not punishment and discipline. He offers here to teach and instruct us the way we should go. This path, this, this way is not only a way, it's the best way. As it's guided by the Holy Spirit of an almighty God. Isaiah 30, verse 21. Your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, it's talking about a promise here to have God guiding us with his eyes, speaking with his voice, saying, this is the way, walk in it. What a great promise. Not just the Old Testament scriptures, but Jesus said in the New Testament, John chapter 16, verse 13. Here, verse 13, a holy, wonderful, wonderful promise of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says here, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So now we have God guiding us with his eyes, speaking with us with his voice. And then we have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us, instructing and teaching us. And so Jesus promised that when the Holy Spirit is come he'll guide us in all truth i like the way agent rogers says it he says it this way when we're in the place of god's purpose there is his presence there is his power and there is his provision god's work is never stopped for lack of resources it is only stopped for a lack of obedience and faith Hey, here's an illustration for you right in the scriptures y'all remember the story of elisha god told elisha hey, i want you to go to a particular place uh, it was Zarephath. And he said to him, I've instructed a widow, uh, a widow woman to feed you there. We see this in Kings chapter seven, first Kings chapter, chapter 17. So Elisha goes, right? And there was a certain woman, just like God said, you remember, and God had to work a miracle because this woman, he says, hey, go, and there's a woman that's going to feed you. He goes, and the woman says, well, I can't feed you because I ain't got any food. I only got enough for me and my son to make one more meal, and then we're going to die. But God, Elisha tells her, hey, just, just do what I'm saying. I'm telling you, God's going to. So she does, and then they eat for days. That's a paraphrase of the story. The key here is this. God told him where to go, told him what was going to happen. And so there is where the provision is. So, so now suppose Elisha had gone where God had, 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 to, had, not, to, had, had not gone where God told him. Would God have fed him? I don't know, but what I do know is this. God told him to go, and God said, here's who's going to be there to feed you. And that's where he was, the miracle took place. And so the place of his presence is the place of his power, and that's where the miracle was done. And the place of his presence and the place of his power was the place of provision. And so we see that right there in illustration, right there in the scriptures. There's instruction and warning as well. And so when God instructs us, do you listen? Honestly, do you listen? I hope you do. There's warning as well. The Word of God says, don't be like the horse or the mule. Now, the speaker here, if you didn't notice, it changed to God in verse 8. Right? So David's talking, and then God starts. And the Lord comes into the psalm there, and he instructs. He exhorts people not to be like the horse. That will not go where its rider wants it to go. So then otherwise the horse has to be distant because it's stubborn. Did y'all know stubborn animals, when a horse will not willfully go where he's led, they'll be controlled by a bit and a bridle. So that bit and bridle is discipline. It brings the horse under control. And God will discipline you when you're not headed down his way. And sometimes he even might put, uh, spiritually speaking, a bit and a bridle in your mouth so you'll go where he wants you to go. And it'll be because he's disciplining you and getting you to listen to what he's telling you to do. And my own testimony is a perfect example of this. Many of y'all don't, most of y'all know this story. 
I ran for God's I ran from God's call for 12 years. That's a long time. 12 years. God God told me, I'm just telling you right now, in a, in a church service at Cantor Baptist Church, I knew I was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I, he said, you're going to be a preacher. You, I'm calling you to preach. I'm calling you to pastor. I said, Lord, appreciate that. I'm a, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a party animal. You just know me. I'm pretty popular too, by the way. Appreciate you. Offer. Thanks. No thanks. See you next Sunday. And for 12 years, almost 12 years, I ran. Now, I wished I could say that the road was easy and I didn't experience discipline. But I'm telling you, if, if there's a picture of a, of a bit and a bridle in a horse's mouth that is stubborn and bucking and just won't listen, that was a picture of me for 12 years. My family went through my discipline. Because, see, they're alone for the ride now and they don't even know it. Tammy had no idea. No idea that I'd been called to preach when she married me. No idea. And they had to suffer consequences. And so it's a great reminder. When God is instructing you, listen. Otherwise, you'll be like the mule, the stubborn. You go in his way. You can go easily or you can go very difficult, but you're going to go his way eventually. If he's got his hand on you. And that is his plan for you. God doesn't want to use a muzzle though. Or a bridle. He wants his people. His servants. His children. To respond promptly. To his instruction. I, I, my story is confession right here. I, mean, I know this. I've lived this. Confession right here in this psalm. Then consecration. Talking about instruction, Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and always acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. This is a promise. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Oh, I wish I would have learned this one faster than I did. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And then you got a concentration. Consecration, concentration, both. It's both of them. Y'all get it? Concentration, you got to concentrate. Consecration. They're spelled differently, by the way. Did y'all know that? <laughs> Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. It's been my prayer, to be honest, ever since. I surrendered on a Sunday night. 23 and a half. I oh know. Going on 24 years ago. Did y'all know this? Everything. I wrote this to Everything you need to know is right here in this book. Did you know that? Everything you need to know. Is right here in this book. Walk in the blessing. Of knowing and obeying the word of God. And get real close to the author. By the way, he wrote all 66 of them. One author of the Bible. Just use some men to pin it. Everything you need to know is right here. Instruction. Last thing will be done. Uh, rejoicing comes with forgiveness. Now this is my favorite part. We ought to be rejoicing. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. That's why the wicked can't rejoice. They don't know the Lord. But he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. You righteous and shout for joy. All you upright in heart. Now forgiveness, being totally reconciled with the Father. That's a joyous position and feeling. It's something to be celebrated. Paul quoted over in Romans 4. Listen in chapter 4, verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. He's, he's telling us this is a joyous experience to be forgiven. Through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now David ends this psalm by contrasting the wicked. Uh, who have many sorrows. With the righteous who are surrounded by the Lord's unfailing love. It's going to be a, a, a devastating sorrow. For those that will enter into eternity. 
into a place called hell. They have no idea what that's going to be like. And I can tell you now on the authority of God's word, it'll never end. That's sorrow. But the righteous don't have to worry about it. Now, the righteous are not those who've never sinned. The Bible is crystal clear on that. We all have sinned. But rather those upright in heart because they have confessed their sins, trusted in the Lord to save them. The thought of God's mercy to sinners who don't deserve it causes David to break forth in joy. Can I just ask the question tonight? When's the last time you just broke out in a state of joy because you realized you're forgiven. When's the last time? I mean, literally, think about it. When's the last time that even came across your mind and you just had a joy, you just had a spell. (laughs) You just had a joy spell. All because nothing that God did to, to, to give you anything other than your reflection on being forgiven. There's no greater joy than knowing that your sins are totally forgiven. See, the forgiveness and freedom from guilt, which Christ offers to all, changes lives. We can be free from guilt before God today and every day. So there's no greater blessing than having your transgressions forgiven, your sins covered, your iniquities not counted against you by the Lord. So the Lord gives us encouraging words tonight in this passage. The Lord desires to give forgiveness. And when we acknowledge our sin, pray to the Lord in repentance, we can have it. And when we have forgiveness, there's joy. The Bible says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. And shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The only way to have righteousness in an upright heart is to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening to this online message from Living Water Baptist Church. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is preached, it demands a response. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 24, that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like a person who built their house on a solid foundation. So if there's a decision you know of that you need to make in response to this message, would you let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org? Whether it's the need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you need to follow through on your salvation and be baptized, or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership, or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, we want to hear from you. So please email us at decision at lwbctriad.org so that we can better minister to you. For more information about Living Water Baptist Church, be sure to visit us online. You can check out our website at www.lwbctriad.org or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us online and we hope to see you in person this coming Sunday.